Um, welcome back. We've reached our final panel of the conference. Um, I'm delighted to chair this session in what I think has been a really productive meeting of historians, uh, clinicians, social scientists, and scientists. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you our final speaker, uh, Yua Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee is an assistant professor in the School of Computer Science here at McGill. <coughs> Prior to joining the faculty at McGill, he earned his PhD in Computer Science and Computational Biology at the University of Toronto in 2014, um, and held a postdoctoral position in the Computer Science and Artificial <coughs> Science Laboratory at MIT. Uh, he also holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Bioinformatics and Statistics from the University of Saskatchewan. Um, his research group here at McGill focuses on developing machine learning approaches to understanding uh, human phenotypes and complex diseases, uh, and looks to questions such as the nature of genetic predispositions, cell type specificities, and gene and pathway functions. And I apologize if my gloss as a historian kind of collapses some very important meanings. Um, okay, all right, great. Um, so Dr. Lee has won numerous grants, including um, an NSERT, prizes in human genetics research, um, and has publications in a number of top scientific journals, uh, including Nature and Bioinformatics, among others. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Lee. All right. Thank you, Rachel, for the introduction, and uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to this uh, workshop. I have to admit that uh, uh, this audience is very uh, diverse to me. Uh, essentially, I often present to uh, you know crowd mostly computer scientists and at least biologists. So, uh, so I have to say there's perhaps some materials that might be a little bit kind of uh, foreign to you, so just feel free to interrupt me, and I'm very interruptible. So the presentation is only 37 slides, so if I don't have any interruption, I'll probably finish in like 20 minutes. So uh, you know, obviously, if I go very fast, but you know, uh, yeah, without further ado, uh, let's just uh, get started. So, so yeah, so today I'll be talking about uh, clinical recommendations by uh, sort of the AI per se, using a kind of software I recently developed. So by recommend, recommendation, I mean uh, we're trying to build this recommender system. You can think of it as a sort of intelligent recommender system where actually you know, the overall sort of vision in my lab is to be able to have the software in uh, every computer in the hospital and say as an assistant to the doctor, not perhaps replacing the doctor to contrary to the theme of this workshop. But uh, you know, uh, ideally it would be like say doctor enter some patient record information and then the computer will give some recommendation. What will be the next, you know, like a disease, what will be the next laboratory test, right, with certain probability, with certain model uh, sort of confidence, right? So that will be the overall theme of my research and also the, the theme of this uh, presentation. All right, so uh, my lab is uh, <coughs> situated in the inter intersection between computational biology and machine learning, right? So we would like to develop novel machine learning uh, approach to actually address various computational problems. So electronic health record data mining is one of the important problems that we try to tackle. All right. So the overall theme is not only you want to actually make uh, accurate prediction, for example, if you can predict, say, certain cancer types with a high pro uh, probability, high accuracy, right? <coughs> so very often that's not convincing enough to, uh, say, clinician or doctor. They usually require some explanation. Right? So that's why you're trying to sort of derive this interpretable model, such that not only you make accurate prediction, but also the model will give you some explanation that why you know, this is the case. Why does this patient have high risk of uh, having certain disease compared to other patients? Right? So this is just an like, oversimplified sort of workflow. So what we're trying to achieve here, right? for any of the diseases, suppose we have a genetic mutation. Right? And then we want to actually figure out what's the relevant cell types, right? Very many complex diseases actually kind of have this origin of uh, onset in different organs of the human body, right? And then uh, from there, we want to figure out, okay, at the genomic level, so what's the regulatory elements, right? In this case, there's a DNA methylation, the enhancer, different like sort of regulatory elements in our human genome, right? And, and now we also want to predict what's the target genes, right? So suppose you want to develop some therapeutic sort of a drug, so what type of protein, what type of gene you want to target, right? Going from the regulatory elements to the disrupted genes. And then we want to figure out what's the connection between the gene and this sort of the endophenotypes. So the endophenotype, <coughs> we interpret that as, as a kind of mediating phenotype between the molecular phenotype and the terminal phenotype, right? So these are, uh, you know, very diverse. For example, MRI, the magnetic resonance 
imaging is a sort of one of the endophenotype that might be have a higher connection with the brain specific diseases, right? And CT scan or spirometry uh, could be you know connected with the COPD or other, <coughs> right? So these are we interpret this as high dimensional endophenotype. And then finally, what their connection with the complex diseases, right? For example, you know what are the genes and mutation and then endophenotype that connect with the asthma or COPD and with the psychiatric disorders. Obviously, these diseases also share some sort of a molecular or endophenotypes that actually you know, kind of contribute together with their complexity of the disease. Okay. Good question. Um, how sure. did you uh, come up with complex diseases rather than chronic diseases? What, yeah. why, how do you define complex diseases? Complex disease, disease uh, I define it as a, in contrast to Mendelian disorder. So Mendelian, essentially, you have one single mutation. For example, cystic fibrosis, you have just one mutation that causes disease. For complex, you have uh, multiple mutations. So okay. uh, very often, we call this a polygenic disease meaning that you have many, many mutations that together contribute to the disease. The a very good example is the human height. So when people take only the significant mutation, they only can explain about 8% of heritability of human height. But if you take the entire mutation, about 1 million mutations, you can explain almost like a 60 or 70% of heritability, which is closer to what people expect. Right? So, so we that is a very high rise complex. then oncology there because there are sub, you know some cancers are not complex other others are like Correct. Can you put so, cancer there too Yeah cancer is not a single disease right obviously there are cancers that are more complicated than others right so uh, obviously you, can't, uh, you know there you know definitely it's not a single mutation Also I think cancer is a little bit different because the somatic mutation is uh, sometimes more important than the germline mutation yeah. So complex disease here I uh, often refer to as the uh, more heritable disease that come from the genetic, uh, like germline okay. All right. And obviously, the environment is also very important, right? So uh, uh, our lab also interested in this gene environment interactions, right? Not only you have the genetic predisposition, right? So you won't have disease <coughs> until you're being exposed to certain environments, right? For example, in the case of PTSD, right? Some lot of patients they have this genetic predisposition, but they they, they feel perfectly fine until they kind of witness some say car accident or they have some childhood drama. Right, and then they later on develop certain like mental or psychiatric issues. Right, so these are environment gene interactions. Okay, so the current state of the art is that we have many many data sets. Right, so the data become kind of recently exploded because this high high throughput technology. Right, so the challenge is how to actually integrate all this information and together to basically interpret the disease as a sort of as it is. Right. So these are just uh, kind of a few examples. For example, uh, there are a large consortia that actually generate a reference map for this epigenomics. So our uh, basically epigenomics is something that's like on top of uh, the DNA. Where actually, uh, if you're familiar with molecular sort of biology, the DNA is not flying around, right? So it's kind of bump around in the chromatin, right? It's the opening and the close of the chromatin that kind of dictate whether a certain gene that is pressed. Right, so that open and close turns out to be very tissue specific. Right, for example, in the brain, the pattern of chromatin opening and close is very different uh, compared with, uh, in, say, the liver or the lung. Right, if you have mutation in certain region of the chromatin opening region, that might disrupt specific genes that are kind of a very brain specific, if you will. So people actually provide this reference profile that kind of a, at the genome level to, to give an idea. Right, so at what region the the, the genome tends to be more active in what type of cell types. So these are kind of a reference sort of panel that we can leverage. Now, of course, we also have you know, knowledge about different uh, variants, different mutations, right? how they associate with different diseases. These are a different sort of a database. And then from here, we can also, uh, there are also another database sort of assay, that not only the genotype, but also the gene expression in different tissues. People call it the GPEX. Essentially, this is across like four <coughs> different tissues for about 800 individuals for like postmortem type of tissues. So the goal here is try to identify this expression quantity of tray loci, where it's abbreviated as an EQTL. So essentially, these are the EQTL that are sort of a tissue specific, right? Some region of the mutation, like I mentioned, might actually disrupt specific gene that in specific organ of the you know uh, the human body, which might actually have potential to cause disease, right? So I mean, the the, the take-home message from here is essentially how do we leverage all this information? I seem to be very overwhelmed. So if you actually uh, look at the specific uh, uh, variant, for example, this is one of the uh, SNP, right, the single uh, nucleotide polymorphism. And then you study their association with a whole bunch of diseases. So the x-axis is different diseases. And then the y-axis is the negative log p-value, meaning that the taller the, the significant they are, 
right? So you can see that one single uh, mutation actually associated with, with many, many diseases. I apologize, the fonts might be a little bit small. For example, here, this mutation is associated with uh, skin cancer, right? And at the same time, it's also associated with the carcinoma in, in situ of skin, right? Which are obviously are uh, two type of related sort of uh, diseases, right? And then uh, the, another mutation associated with, uh, you know, kind of heart-related problems. So here, what this implies is that this is sort of the pleiotropy, right? So essentially, one mutation might cause multiple diseases, <coughs> right? So which is something that we also want to leverage. Essentially, all the diseases are not independent. They're not sort of standalone. It's sort of what connect them together is the underlying mutations, right? That's something that we try to uh, figure out from our model. So if you think of as a sort of a kind of a simple uh, model cartoon, uh, if we know all of the mediating phenotypes, right? So if you know that genetics is associated with a mediating phenotype and at the same time we cause a disease, but then if you know all the mediating phenotypes, we don't actually need to know the genetic information. So all we need to do is actually connect the disease with the mediating phenotype to still actually figure out what's the sort of the underlying mechanism, at least at the uh, phenotype level. So feel free to, again, uh, if you have a question, uh, you know, feel free to interrupt. So for uh, recently, electronic health record has become very kind of uh, uh, prevalent uh, in, uh, in developed country. So what, what is electronic health record? So, so electronic health record, uh, often abbreviated as the EHR, contains many different types of information. So these become very much like electronically standardized, right? So for example, in this in this uh, kind of a picture, so uh, it contains, EHR contains uh, clinical notes, lab tests, billing code, you know, pharmaceutical or a drug or a medication, et cetera, et cetera, right? So these are sort of a very sort of heterogeneous type of information, all describe sort of underlying patient disease state, right? Now the, the challenge is how do we actually kind of model all of these data to together actually distill some meaningful information, right, from the large patient cohort. So if you look at just a, some, a, somewhat like a brief type of a history of the electronic uh, health record technology, uh, so uh, between 2000, starting from 2008, right, so this is a, a map of the uh, United States. So the, the, the blue ones meaning that the state actor uh, has already adopted the EHR. So you can see that from 2008, actually, it's only 9% of hospitals actually have adopted EHR technology. Where in 2015, you can see almost like a, almost all the hospitals, like 96% or 83% of hospitals have adopted EHR technology. It's almost the, uh, all of the states in the, in, in the U.S. So which essentially kind of indicating the, the importance of EHR and also a kind of a, an implication that the, the medical record has become, elect, has, has gone electronic, right? And if you look at this uh, sort of in a more detail, you see that the, the EHR actually has become more and more comprehensive. So what I mean by that, so it's in 2008, so we only have the, the red ones are the uh, sort of the basic with only the clinician notes, right? So essentially the doctor typing some information on the computer. So these are mostly the information that constitute the uh, EHR data. But then you see a sudden increase actually in 2015, the data become more and more comprehensive, which is summarized in this blue bar. So what, the, what does the blue bar include? It include many different data types. Here it include, uh, sorry, let me just zoom in a little bit. So this includes, say, radiology, medications, and you know, nursing orders, you know, uh, for result, from result perspective, lab reports, right? So, and then, you know, many, many different data types. So the data has become very sort of comprehensive, if you will. All right. So now I zoom in. No, I don't want to zoom out. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry about that. Try control zero. Okay, control L, right? Control zero. So this is Adobe, right? Okay. All right, there we go. All right, so uh, as I kind of mentioned earlier, so what's the overall goal of our uh, research? So what we want to do is we take the EHR of any of the patients, right? And then we fit that into our trained model, if you think of as a sort of a AI, if you will, right? So we often call this machine learning. We distinguish between AI and machine learning. Machine learning is a tool, or AI is some like robot running around and trying to make conversation with humans. But that's not what, that's my that's not my goal. But, all right. So so here we try to develop this model, and then what does it do? So you, you make a recommendation, right? So a, a nice analogy would be uh, with uh, say Netflix or Amazon, right? Everyone's using sort of you know one or the other. 
So uh, once you watch the movies, right? So based on what you watch and based on what other users watch, right? Here's a recommended movie, right? So what, with what sort of uh, rating, with what probability, and based on what you purchase from Amazon, they will recommend some certain products. So that would be somewhat similar analogous. Obviously, in the clinical domain, we have to be a lot more careful than than Amazon or Netflix by recommending products, right? But that's like another sort of just an analogy that what we try to draw here. We try to recommend okay, what's the lab test based on current observed patient states, right? So which is very sparse, very uh, kind of a lot of missing data, right? And then we want to actually make a recommendation and then perhaps give an explanation, okay, because the patient has a certain you know, diabetic uh, problem and then we recommend to order this set of tests because there are other patients that actually have similar problem in, say, after six months, these patients develop severe diabetic problem, right? So these are something that we want to make a recommendation as, right? So the recommendation is based on the amount of prescriptions the medical community did? Uh, correct. As, as based on the records? Yeah, so it's based you on... know that it is effective for the prescription? So, yeah, so that's a that's a good question. So so there's a several ways to test, right? So one way in from like a modeling computer science for that perspective is to we first for the data that we already know, right? So say so this patient has been prescribed with a certain drug. So we pretend that we don't know that, right? And then we, we based on other information of this patient, we predict. And then we say, okay, how well do we predict? We compare something that we actually hide from the model. So that gives us some you know, accuracy evaluation, right? So that's kind of an unbiased kind of evaluation. But more ideally, what we want is say we predict the patient has certain disease. And then we're going to find out in six months whether this patient developed, or we're going to call this patient back, right, to do a follow up, to, to do more tests, right, and then to see whether our prediction is accurate, which obviously is more uh, costly than the than former, right? Yeah. Is that a certain question? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so what are we trying to do here? So uh, the, the underlying approach is that we want to actually distill from this very noisy information dif dif distinct sort of disease topic, right? So these are the work cloud. So each cloud is kind of indicating a specific disease topic, right? So, so for example, here, this is a work cloud that describes, uh, you know, kind of neoplasm. Uh, oops, in here. I'm not going to attempt to zoom, zoom in again, sorry. All right. Uh, Right, so these are sort of different work cloud that capture the sort of semantically coherent disease, right, under different, you can think of this as a disease model, right. But how do we actually, you know, kind of approach this problem? It looks like a very kind of daunting task, right. So uh, we actually take a very kind of simple approach, right. So, so the, the, the methodology uh, is, uh, the name is a little bit fancy, it's called matrix factorization, right. So what, what does that mean? Essentially, it's a clustering approach. Right? Suppose I want to predict whether this patient has type 2 diabetes. Right? Suppose I know uh, a certain disease clusters of these patients, right? meaning that if the patient belongs uh, to a certain cluster, they tend to have similar symptoms and similar disease. Right? So also, suppose I have another clustering information that is clustering over disease, diseases. Right? So for example, here, if I want to predict whether this patient has type 2 diabetes, if I know this patient actually belongs to cluster J, and then if the cluster J actually involves type 2 diabetes, right? In this case, I might have some you know, kind of information to predict whether this patient has type 2 diabetes, right? But in reality, all I observe is this current matrix. I don't have actually these tables, I don't have these tables, right? So the model is basically trying to learn these tables simultaneously, right? Such that it can actually recover the, 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 the actual data, right? Recapitulate the actual data that we observe. So that's sort of the underlying uh, learning algorithm that, you know, various, uh, like a brief nutshell, right? So in, in our uh, kind of model that we have developed, we call this uh, mixed EHR or a mixer uh, abbreviation, is that instead of taking just one single table, as I mentioned, the EHR is very heterogeneous, right? So we actually take many, many different uh, tables. In this case, there are lab tests, building code, you know, questionnaire, right? So questionnaires are very often we, we see in the EHR through our collaboration. So essentially, these are two types of questionnaire. One is a more like self-reported questionnaire, right? So uh, especially for a patient with a psychiatric disorder, so they tend to give them, they're given an online form, right? And then they check certain answers based on certain questions. 
right? And there's another uh, kind of questionnaire, it's more like an interview, right? So a doctor will ask patients certain questions and then will record. So these are also become more and more standardized, meaning that there are specific questions that is asked. Each question has a code, right? It has a digital code. And then uh, correspond to each of the answers also have a digital code, right? So these are also something that we try to model. And then, of course, we have prescription. We also have the treatments, right? So these are, you know, uh, become more abundant uh, for single patient measurements. So, okay, what do we want to do here? We want to actually learn from all of these high dimensional data to learn this sort of disease topic, right? So these are, uh, we call this a latent topic because it's not observed, uh, you know, from the, the data, right? But we want to learn this summary information in this uh, lower kind of a dimension sort of um, tables, right? At the same time, we want to actually predict patient risk of belonging to a certain topic, right? So one example here is, sorry, I have to zoom in again. Okay. All right, is if, say, once we have this, so this, it, this you can consider as the models, right? So if you take one vertical slice across all of these tables, so what that gives you, essentially, if you pick, say, the one that actually show up on the top of this column, right, based on their numerical values, based on this is what model actually predicted, right? And then what you can see, essentially, these are the six different data types. So these are, uh, so this is one of the, say, uh, building code, right, the disease-related group, and this is the ITD building code, and this is, uh, you know, procedural, so essentially what treatment that's being actually applied to the patient, and this is a laboratory test, right, and then the, the doctor notes, right, and then the prescription, right, because here I'm taking, oops, Question: Does yeah, Kipa sure. not cover a lot of this data? Like, is, is some of it? It's not confidential, or, or that's just a very yeah. Basic yeah, it's a it's a very good question actually because the the data access is it is very challenging, right? So there has been a, a, a set, a, a, maybe a couple of large consortia has made uh, sort of de-identify patient record data. Mm -hmm. So essentially, the patient are uh, kind of uh, their names and their address has been like a uh, map, <coughs> right? So then moved away, right? Because it's a privacy issue. Right, uh, so so that is uh, the data set that we use. Mm -hmm. Of course, through collaboration with the, uh, for, for example, with the Mayo Clinic, with the MGH, with the, uh, <coughs> other hospitals, and yeah. including uh, Jewish uh, general hospitals, we, we hope we can get like uh, access to uh, large cohort patient data. Of course, uh, respect their privacy just for the academic research purpose. Okay. Right. Yeah. But how do you capture? a year later the disease if there isn't a nominal translation table somewhere. The, sorry, what's the non nominal translation table? If you're if you're using this as reassessing at a year later to see how yeah. the data that you're capturing relates to a prediction. Yeah. It means that there must be a translation table somewhere. Between the name of the patient and the code which anonymized it. Uh, no, so it's not hard, right? So, how? So, why does it have to be a translation table? How do you know me? Yeah. You want to look at me yeah. six months later? Yeah. Yeah. So I must. I must. Uh, uh, that's the question. Okay. So, so we pretend that we don't know. So we have say two emissions for the same patient, right? So one is in uh, say 2015, one is in 2016. So it's only right. retrospective. Retrospective, exactly. Right. So you can Not never, you can never look forwards. Well, we can predict future, but we don't know the answer for future. <laughs> <laughs> so the future. Yeah. Right. Only valid <laughs> retrospective. Got you. No, because it's not a question. The, uh, you it, it, means, it means that no. What it means is that the research that's being done is only retrospectively yeah. for X number of years within the time frame that an electronic health record had enough data, which means that any of, none of these studies can actually go forwards in time. To follow cohorts, like the Framingham study did, for example, yeah. historically, you cannot do it within this kind of ethical confine. Yeah, so, yeah, so that's to validate, uh, prediction. To validate your prediction, you have to also look into the future. Yeah, so I think that's uh, also a limitation in the current data sets, right? So I think uh, there's a large sort of, con it's called Canadian Aging uh, Longitudinal Cohort. So it's still being established. Essentially, they, they, that's their, exactly their long-term goal. So essentially, all these patients are already on their, at their late stage of the disease. It's already too late, right? So what are you going to predict? 
Exactly. Right? So what they want is actually based on early PG, so like uh, these patients are at risk, but they haven't developed any, say, like a severe, say, in this case, it's more of the COPD because COPD tend to be saturated a lot, right? So that's one of the initiatives actually they have, they try to, you know, kind of establish this sort of database. But obviously right now it's still under development, but it's a, it's a very good point. So the pre-EHR model for this, for North America, was the Framingham study, okay. which was a prospective decades worth of following a population that had agreed to participate in the study in the city of Framingham just outside of Boston. Oh, I see. It's thousands of people. It's really worthwhile learning the methodology of that one. Right, right, definitely. Yeah, well, I, I didn't know that, but I definitely know a lot of that. Yeah, thank you for this. Okay. But it seems to me that you're pursuing a different goal than Farringham because here they're just trying to look at modeling, predicting, but they're not actual looking at the outcome. What he would love to do is to do Framingham forwards using all this electronic health record, all the data accumulated, or everything. Sure. Going forwards 10 years so he knows. Yeah not only which lab test, but eventually which sequence in a genome is associated with a cancer of the little finger. Right. Yeah. That's yes. what he would like. Yeah, correct. OK, but what I'm seeing here is not it's what you're not saying. That. Yeah, so and, but I see the value of that. That's what right. I'm saying. So one, one view is to learn, OK, so the model actually doesn't predict things out of the loop, right? It has to be based on certain leverage. So this is what, I, what I'm showing you is the sort of the whole model to learn right, from this high dimensional data. Right, so here you take one slice across all data types. For example, you can see that, okay, this is, say so the top ones are kind of associated with the poisoning due to drug abuse. And this is due to like a renal failure because of alcohol abuse, right? And also poisoning psychosis, right? And then when you look at the billing code, the top one shows up as a bipolar disorder. Second one is schizophrenia. The, the third one is a bipolar, is a different type of bipolar disorder. Third one is another so schizophrenia. Uh, uh, you know, different schizophrenia type of, you know, disease. So, and then when you look at the laboratory test, right, volcaric acid is kind of a substance, actually, kind of a patient with a schizophrenia tend to take certain drugs, right? So these are certain substances tend to show up very frequently, uh, as well as the lithium. Lithium is a, it's also kind of a, one of the drugs, actually, in treating uh, bipolar uh, disorder patients. So, and then when you look at the doctor notes, right, doctor notes are very noisy, right? But if you look at here, it's actually, it's, it's just the abbreviation for psychiatric psychosis and bipolar, schizo, you know, lithium, you know, these are different mix of keywords, if you will, right? So the, 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 what I'm showing you here essentially is the model without knowing the meaning of these, all of these like the words and the billing code and the lab test is able to actually group them together in a coherent way under the same sort of disease topic, right? So these are across different data types. Right, so this is what actually the model learned from this uh, heterogeneous data, right? So which, you know, obviously there are some something that's very noisy, but we, we tend to think these are semantically meaningful, right? Without actually kind of uh, teach the model, okay, what, what, what this means, right? And then in terms of prediction, uh, so now I need to uh, go back again. In terms of prediction, because we're learning this tables and this table simultaneously, right? So here, this, yellow table is essentially is the risk of specific group of patients belonging to this topic. Now suppose we know this topic is associated with the psychosis. Now we can take, look at the, the score of this patient and then to pick up the patient with the top scores, which is the patient that have a high risk of belonging to this psychosis topic, right? So this is a way to actually predict, like sort of prioritize what patient actually have a high risk for developing certain diseases. Right? Presumably, some of the patients have high score, but they are not diagnosed yet. Right? But we can base on other information to make predictions. Right? So we can do sort of both, sort of learning what are the, maybe some topics are uh, somewhat surprising. Maybe you know, the model try to associate different diseases with uh, some, something that we don't know about. Right? So essentially, learning the novel comorbidity of the disease, if you will. And at the same time, we use that as a, as a model to predict the patient risks. Right. So that's, that's basically what we're right. Okay, so we have applied a, 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 couple, a couple of data sets. In, uh, so the first one we apply is called a MIMIC, which essentially is uh, kind of from the Boston area. So the, 
people have actually made a tremendous efforts to, to make the data publicly available. So these are about uh, uh, 40,000 patients, right, uh, with uh, you know, very different diseases. So the patients are actually admitted to this intensive care unit. That's why we, we tend to have a lot more observations for these patients compared with the outpatient record, right, because these patients stay in the hospital for, for a very long period of time, and then they, they, you know, they prescribe certain lab tests, they have you know, different like, uh, description uh, by a doctor or nurses, right, or uh, uh, many different clinicals. So these are uh, sort of different uh, you know, uh, clinical measurements, you know, the clinical notes, clinical procedures, lab tests, et cetera. Right? So overall, we have about 46,000 uh, observations right, for the distinct measurements for, for each uh, individual patient. Right? But you know, for each individual patient, it's only measured with a very small fraction of uh, you know, one of these measurements. Right? So obviously, you can't measure everything on, on the same patient. Right? So, so in, uh, but overall, the data is still quite large. So we have about 12 uh, million uh, <coughs> measurements or observations, over uh, 46,000 distinct measurements for about 40,000 patients. Right? So these are the training data, if you will, to, uh, for our model to actually learn the, the underlying disease associations. Right. Can you just clarify the lab tests? When you sure. say 563, what, do you, what is that? So these are the, based on this, uh, this, uh, this code. This is the, uh, I, I forgot the, uh, the, uh, the full name for the code. So there are 563 different codes. Yeah, for each lab test. Yeah. And then for each lab, for, for each lab test, you also have a standardized results, right? Whether the, you know, the result turned out to be, say, for certain blood pressure, right? Whether it's abnormally high or abnormally low, right? So there's certain standard for, for actually kind of make the result also standard. Okay, so and then we applied it, uh, our model to this data set, and then what we learn is here is a kind of a, a just a select uh, as an illustration purpose a, uh, s a selection of topics that we learn, right? So the top the columns are the disease topics, where the rows are the uh, the the underlying measurements that are uh, have a high intensity under that topic, right? So here we pick uh, five the top five sort of measurements for. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure you can see this. Probably won't. Yeah. Right. Good. right. So yeah. So here we pick the top five per topic. Right. So we pick uh, six topics. So actually, we learn seventy-five topics. Well, of course, we can't show everything in one slide. Right. So here, just as a illustration purpose. And then this, the labels is something that I put in. Right. So essentially, based on what model learned, I think oh, this is related with cirrhosis. You, know, you can correct me because I'm not the doctor. So, but just for the kind of the illustration purpose, this is with a pulmonary embolism, and then the color in here is showing different data types, right? So, for example, the purple is the procedures. What procedure have been actually treated, have been applied to the patient, and then uh, the uh, let's say the brown one is the billing code, and then the uh, the gold color is the, the another sort of billing code, and then the, the green one is the doctor knows, and the uh, the uh, sorry the uh, what, what do you call this color? Uh, the, the forest green is Dr. Knowles, and, mm -hmm. and then the, another green is a <laughs> Smith, Smith apple right. green. <laughs> Purple, right? That's the color. Right. right, so yeah, so, for, so basically, the, what, we, what we're trying to show here is that we, we were able to learn something that's, you know, again, uh, meaningful, you know, just from a non trained eye. Uh, obviously, you know, I, there's, for example, in here, right? So HIV, for example. Right, so these are you know obviously different sort of uh, HIV type of uh, building code, right? That all you know indicating the same disease. Oh. Uh, all right, so that's that's what the the model. For example, here is a associated with the diabetes, right? So you can see the insulin, you know, and then uh, you know neuropathy in diabetes, you know. So these are another topic, right? See how sharp the topic is, right? For example, in the first topic. Right, so these are very <coughs> have a very high like probability belonging to the first topic as opposed to belonging to other topics, right? Because the other ones are all empty, right? So that is kind of like uh, we found it's quite interesting because this actually taught us something about you know what these are associated together, right? Can so, I just ask you a question? Yes. So if you look at leukemia or lymphomas, yeah. Yeah. people are often put on steroids or decathlon, which causes their insulin to go their glucose to go high. What would happen if, in your looking at your lab test for leukemia, yeah. someone actually had a high glucose? What would happen? Because it does happen. 
You mean because the treatment actually can sort of introduce? Ah, I see. Uh, it's possible that the glucose might high glucose might be grouped together under the leukemia topic because mm -hmm. the downstream treatment, right? Mm -hmm. So that is something that we we didn't we didn't uh, address in the order, right? So that's like a, not really associated with the leukemia, right? Per se, it's just like the because yeah, the treatment, yeah. right? Yeah. So it kind of like you know, but like so from this perspective, separate. it's not like. You know, from a maybe physiological standpoint, it's not really, you know, associated with the leukemia, but it's because of the training, right? Mm -hmm. So, in this case, we might actually pick up some of that, mm -hmm. right? So that's obviously something that we need to be careful in terms of interpreting the, this, this topic, right? Yeah. I'm not sure what this adds. This what? I'm not sure what this adds. How this gets to be used after? If you look, for example, at HIV, yeah. human immune immunodeficiency disease, by mm -hmm. definition, it's that. If you look at HIV, major right. related condition, that's why he's in the ICU. Yeah. With multiple related conditions, that's why he's in the ICU. So, diabetes, I'm not sure. Those are the kind of things that would be expected. So, I'm not sure yeah. what you do so, with this act. So, this, this is obviously a proof of concept. Right? So, we're trying to show, okay, without knowing anything, they're actually, obviously, they're the same thing, right? They're mm -hmm. method, right? So what, what's the use of this, right? So here, obviously, we, we are actually, this is another question that perhaps with the input from the doctors, then we are able to actually further refine the model to make it more useful. But so far, it has been proof of concept, right? Obviously, if you, if you look at something that's down the line for the same topic, you might find something that's not as like a high probability as uh, these top ones. But maybe those ones are more interesting. Right, because these ones are maybe the something that we already know, right? Something that we expect. That's why they have high probability in the first place, right? But that when we look at actually the one that with a somewhat lower probability, right? There are some maybe interesting biology that tend to reveal itself, right? So that is, you know, obviously right now just for illustration purposes, I only show something that you know kind of uh, more uh, coherent with with, uh, with uh, what they meant for. So I, I'm also curious about multiple diseases, because after all, as the as our population is getting older. We have absolutely, like, if you have dementia, you possibly have uh, diabetes, you could have HIV, you could, you know, and there's, there's no reason why a lung disease, whatever, like almost, I don't know, but maybe you can tell me what percent of our population would come in with multiple comorbidities, 20, 25? Anyway, there's a, there's a serious percentage. What would happen on, the, on your proof of concept if you had two diseases, like, let's say, dementia and diabetes? Yeah, so, so yeah, so that's, that's a... Um... That's an excellent question. So essentially, our goal is not only we want to learn this topic distinctly, right? But you also want to mix, like certain topics, maybe they're related, right? So you could have one topic that is associated with the dementia, one with the diabetes, and then you have a third topic that's associated with both, right? So it's very possible in that case, right? So then from there, we, we know that there's some sort of comorbidity that's involved, right? Obviously. Just by eyeballing, we, we, we require some expertise to actually appreciate uh, whether some comorbidity is, is real or some are just like some of them just artifact, right? Like you mentioned, it could be the leukemia is treated with a certain you know glucose uh, with certain treatment. That's why they have high glucose. So maybe they, they can be interpreted as artifacts, or you know there's just some you know it depends on how how you interpret them, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. So okay. Okay, I only have uh, 20 minutes. All right, but okay, so I, I guess this is pretty much the stuff I want to show. All right, and then what we can uh, further do is so this is another interesting analysis, right? So we take all these topics, and now we want to say, okay, what are the topics that are related with the age, right? So here, uh, so from the so what we, what we did is we sort of take this topic, these topics are numerical representation, right? So we take them and then we correlate with the age of the patient. And now we want to say, okay, as the as patient actually grow uh, like, uh, older, so what type of disease they tend to develop, right? So that's one way to interpret this. Uh, again, this is not, obviously not a causal, a causality, obviously we need to interpret that more carefully. And then the top three, these are the top three topics that are positively correlated with age. And then we also take the, you know, the bottom three topics that are negatively correlated with age, right? So from here, we can see the top, the top one, the first one is associated with the heart failure, and then the second topic is associated with the cardiovascular disease, and the third one with the dementia, 
right? So uh, how do we know? Well, we, we, you know, we take a look at the building code, right? So these are obviously, again, so this is maybe something that's, that uh, we just discussed. For example, here, for mental disorder and dementia, we also found the major respiratory infections, right? So obviously, as the patient got more and more senior, they tend to have many, many details, right? So it's a little bit hard to distinguish what exactly the, you know, the, how they, whether they're connected like a, uh, with the real biology, or actually they, come, they just connect it because, because of the age of the patient, right? And then when we look at the negatively correlated uh, topics, we see that they're all related with the baby infants, right? So first one is just treatment for you know, uh, infants, and then the same as the, the second one and the third one, right? So which obviously makes sense, right? Because shouldn't so it be like 100% probability correlated? Like, yeah, it's not the correlation. The correlation is almost negative one. So because it is, according to the color chart, your negative correlation for neonate is like 0.2 or 0.1. Yeah, yeah. So these are the the, the one that uh, you know this specific term under that topic. That's the probability. But the correlation is uh, correlating all of all of these with the patient uh, with the patient age. You see what I mean? So okay. So let me explain that a little bit more. All right. So if you look, take a look at this one, uh, so this is maybe a little bit. So this is associated with the kind of uh, related with the patient prediction. So remember, I mentioned that here's a topic, and then here's a patient score, right? So from here, I know the topic, and from here, I associate it whether this patient belongs to that topic, right? So what I just show you, the, the correlation is correlating this patient score with the patient ages, right? And now, I, so for each of the topic, I did correlation with their ages, right? Now I take the top three correlated topic and the bottom three correlated topic. Now I look at this dimension, right, this view here, and now what I, what I, what I want to see is, okay, what are the content of this topic, right? So the probability essentially is the content of the topic. Right, does, that, does that make sense? Okay. All right. So that's, yeah. So, yeah, so, so we found that interesting. And then uh, another thing that we can do is, so once we learn the sort of the disease, uh, you know, for per say, so here each of the term is represented by 75 numbers, right? So we can also take a disease that we're interested in, for example, schizophrenia. And now we want to correlate uh, them between different diseases, right, in terms of their sort of the embedding, right? In this case, I want to say, okay, what's the related disease with the schizophrenia? Right. Oops. Sorry. Uh, oh. Right. So, what's the related sort of the EHR code or terms associated with the schizophrenia? So, here, from here, you can see the delusion right from doctor notes is the top one, right? And then schizophrenia also is associated with itself, right? There's also bipolar disorder, right, which is associated with, with the schizophrenia, which makes sense because they share a substantial genetic architecture. And there is a you know, specific you know, uh, drug which is treating for uh, schizophrenia patients. Right? So that's another uh, kind of useful way to, to learn from you know, what's, what's the you know, kind of a peripheral of that center disease. Right? So here is uh, what we learn. Oh, man. So here's what we learn from uh, PD, PDS. Right, and then here's another example that we learned from PDSD. So the top one is just the PDSD that's taken in the doctor notes, right? This is just the full name for PDSD, right? For the building code, right? We also learned that you know it can be associated with a different uh, you know drug that also treat uh, bipolar or schizophrenia patients. So these are different medications, right? All right, and then bipolar and schizophrenia also show up you know on the top chart, right? Which you know also kind of makes some sense. Right. And we also learned the conflict fact, right? A patient with a psychiatry tend to take different drugs, right? They tend to have a more like addiction to, to drug, and then they, they got caught, uh, you know, uh, poisoned, right? So that's something that we learned from as a behavior trace from per the, per the patient. All right. So, and then uh, what we can do uh, in terms of big patient prediction, right? So as I mentioned earlier, 
Okay, so we here uh, this is uh, another illustration for three topics. So we pick patient belong to uh, cirrhosis. So these are the workload that describe cirrhosis, a workload that describe pulmonary embolism, and the workload with the uh, leukemia. So we take the top 50 patients, right? So these are the color bar indicating this patient has high score for leukemia, and patient with a high score for uh, pulmonary embolism, and patient with high score for cirrhosis. And then we look at the uh, the actual building code. Right, or the diagnosis, right? We see that so for these top 50 patients, for example, so the red meaning that these patients have leukemia, and then the gray means that patient didn't get diagnosed with the leukemia, right? So these are maybe the patients at risk, right? And here is the, the blue ones means the patient have a pulmonary embolism, and then the, the green ones meaning that patient have cirrhosis. We see that indeed the top patients that we have picked up are actually the patient diagnosed with these diseases. Right? So which kind of give us some indication that the model actually doing something useful. Right? And then when we look at the patient, okay, what, what's happening when this patient actually didn't get diagnosed? Right? So then we look at the... the uh, and then we look at the, the actual patient observation. Right? So these are the, the gray ones are the patient didn't get diagnosed with the leukemia. Right? And then here are the evidence that essentially uh, observed on the patient that perhaps in, uh, drive the model to believe that the patient had leukemia. For example, in here, you know, the patient, so this patient did not get diagnosed with leukemia, actually is undergone like a bone marrow biopsy. So there's a certain, like, a, I think it's a, uh, I don't know what this is. Actually, this, this is a, a, a treatment procedure, right? And the other one is, uh, you know, with a, a chemotherapy, right? So that is one model thing that, you know, perhaps, since they have those sort of, uh, uh, you know, entries, that's why they maybe have a high risk of uh, leukemia, right? So that is uh, something that we think is uh, perhaps useful. Uh, and then when we look at the... Uh, yeah, I apologize for this. All right, so now when we look at the cirrhosis, right, so, so these are top patients that we, we predict to have cirrhosis, and some of them you see that in that nose, but then when we look at their doctor notes, right, the cirrhosis keywords actually mentioned in all of the top 50 patients, right, which is uh, why we predict these patients are at, uh, at high uh, risk of uh, having cirrhosis. Again, this may be something that we expected, right, but right now just for as a proof of concept, right. All right, so to be able to predict specific risk, right, so obviously patients are very, uh, patient disease or the alterations are very complex, right? So suppose that I want to predict whether a patient have cancer, right? So this is getting a little bit more computer science, right? So it's a little bit hard to separate. So here are the red dots are the patient with the disease, or the blue dots are the patient, are the healthy individuals, right? So it's hard to actually draw a linear line to separate the two cohorts, right? So our goal here is to sort of transform this graph into something like this as a kind of different way of representing the patient such that we can actually draw very easily a linear line to separate you know, the patient with the disease and, and in a normal controls, right, without disease, right? So we, uh, we have, as a proof of concept again, so we have used this uh, sort of approach uh, as I mentioned, using the lower representation of the patient to predict mortality, right? Because these patients are, uh, 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 you know, in the ICU, sort of intensive care, that means they're all in a critical condition, right? So it would be very cost-effective to predict, you know, whether this patient actually end up dying in six months, which is what we did. So we trained the model and we learned the disease topic, and then we used the disease topic as a representation for the patient, and then we predict whether they actually end up dying in six months. Right, so these are more like prospective prediction, right? So you can see that our model actually tends to have a good performance. This is based on the ROC, the receiver operator characteristic curve, compared with some of the baseline model. And then when we, well, because we can predict specific mortality, we can also uh, look at what topic actually contribute to the accurate prediction. So the cyan colors are the th top three topics that are highly correlated with the mortality. Whereas the green ones are the topic that actually negatively correlate with, with the mortality. 
right? And then when we zoom in to see, okay, what's the top dying, like death topic, right? So the first one we see is with the cardiac arrest, right? Again, these are the top uh, six uh, terms under that topic, right? Uh, also with the renal failure, for example, the second one actually is with the renal failure, right? So if you have any of these diseases, you, you can have high risk of uh, dying in six months, right? And then the, the, uh, the, the third one is with the respiratory problem, right? Uh, with the uh, you know, septic semia, right? Which is, uh, I think, as I understand, it's a life-threatening kind of infection, right? Where the negative topic, uh, the one that actually negative correlated with, the, with our model uh, prediction is, is associated with, the, again, with an infant, with a newborn uh, baby, right? So you can, from here, you can see all of these terms are just like normal baby, right? So essentially the risk, the baby died in six months is very low. So that's what we're trying, that's what we, what we learn from this. Right. Okay. So I think as a maybe an interest of time, I'll stop here. There's a there's a more stuff actually, you know. I don't I don't need to cover this. So this is just the you know, kind of the I think that's that's enough. <laughs> All right, so question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, machine learning is trying to predict all kinds of things right now. We have IBM Watson that's predicting what is the best treatment for a patient with cancer. Can you just situate what you're doing with the bigger picture of predicting model, predictive models in machine learning? So how is this fitting with the puzzle of using machine learning to predict either health outcomes or treatment recommendations? Yeah, yeah so... So I think, uh, to my knowledge, most of machine learning methods are focusing on one disease, right? So I want to predict COPD, right? So these are, uh, the machine learning jargon is called supervised learning. So essentially I have one goal, just to predict. Our approach is, uh, in the machine learning jargon, is called unsupervised learning. So we actually don't have any disease label that we try to predict. So at the very beginning, uh, as you remember, we actually learning this topic Right, without supervision. So supervision is something like, you know, if the model gets wrong, we want to penalize it. So suddenly you do it right the next time. But in here, the model is essentially learning the underlying data distribution, right? Without actually being told what wrong, what, what was right, right? So we tend to find that met uh, methodology tend to be more, uh, you know, kind of drip, uh, discovery driven, right? And also it kind of, uh, you know, teach us, okay, what, what's the probability, what, what are the underlying diseases. But at the same time, it's also more amenable to this sort of, what we call this fat data, right? So what is fat data? Fat data essentially in biology or in a lot of clinical domain, we have very small sample size where the measurements are lost. For example, if you do genotyping, right? So often you maybe you have maybe 500 patients, but then genotyping is across like 1 million uh, SNPs. Right, one million mutations. Right, in this case, for predicting specific patient having disease, it's very difficult because it's very high dimensional data. Right, instead of doing that, we try to learn what are the you know kind of underlying association among all of these uh, you know uh, features. Right, clinical phenotypes. Right, at the same time, we can use that, to leverage that to make prediction. Right, in the, as I mentioned, in how do you separate a very high dimensional data in a linear with a linear hyperplane? Right, so that's what we're trying to do. We try to translate the high dimensional data into lower dimension, and then such that that separation becomes much, much easier. And at what point do you see that the clinical input would be very informative in your process? Like, when do you see that it would be very productive to, to introduce clinical or other inputs, data? Input like a doctor inputs or like human inputs? Or? Yeah, or documentation that is disease specific or clinical right, reasoning. Right. Like at what point in your yeah, process? I think at all, uh, at all the points. Right? All so the points. Especially, I think at the very beginning, if you do have some information, right, you yeah. can treat that as a sort of prior information. So right do you have now, people we, on your team that do that at the moment? or? Uh, well, I have a, I have written several models. Okay. So one of them is able to take prior information. So you have some information about this specific disease or some disease comorbidity. Right? So I know this topic. Right? I can put that as my prior information. Of course, I don't want the model to completely rely on it, because okay. otherwise it defeats the purpose. I can't just look at the, the information, right? Yeah. But I want the model to actually slightly prefer something that's already known, but at the same time still learn new things from the data, right? Yeah. So it's unsupervised, but a little bit supervised. 
It's, uh, yeah. 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 Okay. It's so me. 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 Yeah. Yeah. We can talk about that. Sure. Thank you. Just a, a couple of questions about limitations of your methodology. Yeah. So, for example, you, you have an address that DRGs are known to be less than reliable after the 1990s in the US because of DRG creep and a whole bunch of factors. Yeah. So, how do you compensate for that? How do you deal with natural language misreads of yeah. your yeah. system? Yeah. Um, Definitely. So I think DRG is, uh, as you mentioned, is, is getting replaced by SED. And SED is probably getting replaced by the Snowman ID or something. They're, you know, they keep evolving, right? So it just become better. But you're going backwards. You're going yeah. backwards. So, but this is what we have. Of course, it's a legacy problem, right? So, I mean, for large patient cohort, we have some, you know, SED is already all day. We use SED 9, now it's SED 10, right? So, you know, these are some that we have. Ultimately, they will become better. Right, so that's, you know, the better data, the better the model learns, right? So in that case, I wouldn't attribute that as a limitation of the model. It's a limitation of the data, right? Because in, in computer science, you have to say, uh, you know, garbage in, garbage out, right? So if, if the data is are just meaningless, that you can't learn anything from something that's meaningless, right? So, so that, I don't, I don't think that's a limitation of the, of the model per se. Uh, Sorry, what's the other yeah, one? one had to do with the notes, the physician notes yeah. or the nurse's physician notes, notes natural yeah. language interpretation. So that is, I'll say that's partially an indication because right now we treat them as a bag of words. So what does bag of words mean? So what a human, human, we write sentences, right? So what we do, we break down into words that are independent, completely independent from each other. And then we learn this word cloud, right? Just based on how frequent they occur in specific set of patients that belong to the same disease topic, right? Obviously, the, you know, the doctor, they, when they write it, they don't have spell check, they don't have a grammar, right? So we, when we look at the notes, there's no perfect English, right? So, but, you know, we still can learn something useful, right? But ideally, we want to learn something more like a document, like a curated document, right? Using natural language processing. Where they, uh, machine learning, NLP, what they tend to uh, kind of uh, become very uh, successful is to mining this curated document with the perfect English, right? You can mine Wikipedia, for example. Right, so these are you know, grammatically correct uh, language. <coughs> and then you can learn this sequence of sentences, right? So giving this current word, what's the subsequent word, right? It might be the doctor mentioned, for example, patient has certain history. Maybe in the next sentence, or the next three sentences, it's going to mention psychosis or something like that, right? But if the notes have become very kind of curated from, you know, the EHR perspective, we're able to actually apply maybe not the bag of words, but, you know, more like a natural language. Processing a, a, perhaps a recurrent neural net or some language, a neural language model, <laughs> you have to be better about than this. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. I just so now that you've shown a proof of concept, what are your next steps with your machine learning model? Yeah, so uh, so right now we're actually, uh, you know, I'm still like, trying to find collaborators. Obviously, we have a few collaborators right now with, uh, you know, on specific things. Right, so I had to show a sort of, a, we have actually delved into details about PTSD. So we have this data set from uh, Greeley Memorial Hospital at, at Atlanta. So we, uh, so here the step is we're trying to learn the topic from the patient's uh, questionnaire. Same time we have a genotype information. So we try to associate genotype with specific answer to the question, right? And then we also, obviously PTSD or, or autism, these are complex diseases, right? So this is not just a single disease. We're trying to actually categorize the spectrum of disease, right? By grouping them into different categories. And then to associate that with the genotype. Maybe they have, they have a shared certain mutation, but they might have some different mutation that cause their degree of uh, you know, disease severity. So that is more like a biological discovery. In terms of prediction, uh, you know, we are also interested in you know, getting a large cohort patient and trying to validate the model in terms of how well do we predict for specific disease, which is something that I also have a later slides, but I, I did not have control. So would you want to validate it using the model that was trained on the MIMIC data, or would you be trained on yeah. the new data? Yeah, so probably we'll train on uh, uh, other data, set because MIMIC is uh, very specific. Yeah, it's very ICU-ish data type. But more often, uh, you know, the larger cohort coming from all patient data. Also, uh, something that we didn't address is longitudinal. Especially for all patient data, right? How well do we predict based on based on current state 
how well do we predict in the next two years, right, in the next five years, right? Obviously, the model confidence tends to drop as you go, you know, more and more into the unknown future, right? Mm -hmm. So that's something that we try to model the longitudinal data, which is especially abundant in the outpatient data. I have one quick question, if I can, just right at the end of the session, um, about who benefits from uh, from this type of technology potentially. So you alluded to prevention and early intervention with yeah. patients, but are there ways in which doctors would be using it? Um, are there ways in which um, it could be used to assess liability for insurance companies? Like, I'm, yeah. Just help me think through some of the potential applications. Yeah, I think uh, I think right now only the researchers benefit. So we okay. <laughs> some, some of we kind of play with ourselves, but you know it's. So you're trying but, to imagine. Yeah, the but obviously, I mean to, to deploy it as a usable software, right? Mm -hmm. We still could be far from that, right? Obviously, as you mentioned, there's patient privacy, mm -hmm. right? And then. Uh, you know, doctors essentially, unless, so I, I talk with the, the, you know, few clinicians, right, unless this become really, really useful, they, they don't actually, they don't think it is very useful, they, they, they consider it as a nuisance, they consider it as an extra work they have to do, right, for example, electronic record, they have to actually spend time to type into the computer, so enter specifically in the table, such that the model is able to learn it, right, right now they, they, they tend to think it's probably not that useful, so we're not at the stage that we can directly convince them that, oh, you, you know, you use this, or you will improve your diagnosis, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a, there's a methodology standpoint, there's also maybe a communication standpoint, right? So how do you actually communicate, not as a computer scientist, but, you know, as someone that, you know, talk in common language with the doctors? So I think that's something it takes to be uh, present in the hospital to actually see what exactly is going on. And, uh, I, you know, I learned a lot from my senior, uh, you know, co colleagues, about how you interact with the you know clinicians and you know how to work with the different data types, but these are definitely a very important uh, kind of uh, future work that I need. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, please help me um, thank Dr. Lee.